morning. It's good to be with you all to be sharing God's word again this Sunday morning. The Lord is good. And uh, let's pray before we start. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word and the gift of this time. Thank you for the gift of our gathering, even as it's online, but we thank you that you're not limited by situation or by technology or, or resources, but you can use all of that and much more to bless your people with your presence and your word. And I pray that would precisely happen now, Lord. Bless us with a fresh outpouring of your spirit. Enlighten our darkness. Illuminate our hearts with the understanding, the brilliance of your word. Ignite our hearts again to worship, to obey, and to honor and glorify you with our lives. We come at this time into your hands. I pray for all of us hearing your word. Help us to be attentive, to incline our ears and our hearts, not superficially, but wholeheartedly, that we may hear your voice as your sheep, and that you would be able to lead us as our good shepherd. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I want to share on a subject that has baffled believers, no less than unbelievers. One that poses many a time a serious test to our faith in God, and that is the subject of suffering. Painful and horrible things happen in this world. Millions are put to death in concentration camps. Hurricanes and tsunamis unleash their murderous fury on unsuspecting populations. Women are raped. Children are molested. Individuals sodomized. The poor and vulnerable are oppressed and afflicted. Too many to mention and too painful to remember. Loved ones pass away and others suffer in prolonged sickness. Even now, there is increasingly severe persecution faced by Christians in many parts of the world. On a personal level, we often experience the wrong done by other people unjustly against us. Some suffering is situational. That means you change the place, it stops. Some can be seasonal, it's for a brief period of time. But some can even be deeper and lifelong. And it raises the question, if God exists, why does he allow any of it? <clears throat> Beloved, the problem of evil and suffering is considered by many people to be the strongest argument against the existence of God. And the reasoning goes like this. If God exists, he is all-powerful and he's all good. If so, he is then surely in a position to stop evil and suffering immediately. But we know from experience that evil and suffering go on in the world, scandalously, mercilessly, without even a hint of proportion or justice. And so atheists say there cannot be an omnipotent being capable of preventing all of this from happening. Because if there were, he surely would. Therefore, they say God does not exist. But here is precisely my argument and my encouragement to you this morning. Because God is all-powerful and because he is all-good, he will, not very long from now, forever end all of the evil and suffering mankind has ever known and experienced and bring his people into a place of everlasting and infinite joy. And he has already given us the full display of his love, power, provision, and assurance of this by the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for our sins and the sins of all of mankind. For on that cross, by one astounding act of his sacrifice, of eternal and infinite value, he dealt with sin and with every and all of its evil consequences. Let's take some time to talk about the origin of suffering. So we must ask therefore one more time, why do bad things 
happen to good people? I'm sure that you've heard that question before. The Christian answer or the biblical answer to that question is that there are no good people. In the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 23, the Apostle Paul writes that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in that very chapter, he emphasizes further, there is not one, no, not one who does good. None of us deserves the life that we have, which is a gratuitous gift from God. In the Bible, God helps us understand to an extent the origin of suffering. In this world, at least, our sin instigated by Satan, the enemy of mankind. Throughout the Bible, it records the details of how sin and suffering were sin and spread like a decaying, degrading disease across all of mankind, not because of God, but because of the sinful choices of men and women. But for our comfort and hope, the Bible especially records redemptive stories of comfort and hope of how men and women, not exempt from suffering, in their suffering sought God, wrestled with doubts, overcame in faith to find God in their suffering and trusted him to do good in this life and especially in the life that is to come. They were prepared to face all of the uncertainty of this life with the certainty of the beautiful life that is to come. The Bible helps us see clearly that God was not and is not ever the cause of evil and suffering. God is good. Man, by his choice, introduced sin and all of the evil consequences that followed and suffering into this realm that we call the world. And it is God who has already made the eternal provision for all things to be made new and beautiful forever in just a matter of time. You know, the Bible dedicates an entire book to this question of suffering. And it's the book of Job. Interestingly, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And in this book, we see that Job boldly, angrily, and eloquently poses to God this question. Job's point is that he's a good man. So why should he suffer? Why are his children, health, and possessions taken away from him? Why would God treat anyone this way he sees? Or he asks, let alone one of his devoted servants. 33 chapters in the book of Job record Job pouring out his heart in questions after questions and expressions of anguish and pain. And after much silence, God responds to Job, interestingly, not in answers to Job's questions, but with four chapters that record God kind of questions to Job. Rather than reply directly to Job, God asks Job, what gives the creation or creature the right to question its creator? Did Job make the universe? Does he understand the workings of it? Did he give himself life? God seemed to be pulling rank on Job here. And Job finally backs down, overwhelmed that he has seen and heard God. Surrendering to him without having his questions answered, Job finally responds in humble trust and then worship. Thus Job, became, Job, thus Job becomes not a scholar with all the answers to the questions about suffering. But to us, he becomes a biblical hero of faith who had progressed from hearing about God to seeing God in his suffering. My brothers and sisters, God's purpose in the world is to draw his creatures to him. And the empirical evidence is that pain and suffering precisely help to do that. Where the darkness is the darkest, the light shines the brightest. 
where hate abounds, the love of God rages even more fiercely. At this point of time, I can imagine the indignant outburst that someone can have towards me saying, are you saying that God causes horrible things to happen just so that people can turn to him? The answer is yes. If a lifetime of suffering, which is brief, can result in eternal good, I ask you back, why not? To repeat, God didn't cause this to happen. Blame guns, blame evil dictators, blame corrupt people in high places. Most of all, blame ourselves, our sins. But don't blame God. As C.S. Lewis points out, most of the evil and suffering in the world has been produced by human beings with whips, guns, bayonets, gas chambers, and bombs. These crimes are not divinely inflicted, but man-made. Even so, it is not unreasonable to suppose that there is a providential purpose behind history, he writes. And if human horrors show us our dependence on God's love and restorative powers, that's not a bad thing. In no way is God responsible for evil. He is responsible by his wisdom and power only for using that evil to bring forth eternal good. I just want to, for a minute, if I may say, shift the topic slightly and then come back to what I want to really bring forth and communicate from my heart to yours uh, this time. <clears throat> and what I want to just say right now, there is a kind of suffering that the Bible commands us or encourages us to not suffer. And that is suffering for our own wrong. In 1 Peter 2.20, the Apostle Peter writes, For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? I repeat, for what credit is there when you sin and are harshly treated? You endure it with patience. But if, when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. In other words, Peter is saying that there is no profit and there is no benefit of any kind if we suffer for our own sins, for our own wrongs. So that is the kind of suffering that we must ask God's grace to avoid. We lose relationships. We lose health. We lose opportunities to do good. We do harm and hurt to others because of our own wrong choices and suffer the consequences of it. And that is something we must seek to sincerely avoid by the grace of God. I want to come back and I want to kind of close this in from a personal space. And what should be our response in suffering? For us as followers of Jesus, we see in the scriptures that the Bible places high value on those who suffer for God, godliness, or even unjustly. So I'll just read a few scriptures that will bring clarity on this. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 10 to verse 11, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow, what an encouragement. Jesus is saying, you are blessed. You are congratulated by me. You are commended by me when you suffer in my name, for my name. And your reward in heaven is great. Those of you who have experienced this amount of suffering... Blessed are you, my brother and my sister, my friend. In the book of James, chapter 1, two, verses 2 to verse 4, James helps us see something far more deeper and precious that God does in the times of suffering. He says, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, for there are many. 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And that is precious. What James is saying over here is that God does some very priceless, precious, powerful things in the times of suffering in our lives. And he says, because that is going to happen, because God is going to do something in your life in this time of suffering that does not happen in other times in your life, consider it all joy. Consider it all joy. Be able to put it all together in your heart and mind and come to a place of resolution that God will work this out for my good, for the good of many, and above all, for his glory. Because he is going to do his perfect work and complete it so that I am lacking in nothing in him. And further, James writes in that same chapter, verse 12, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, for there will be an approving, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Here is the secret to endurance and persevering under trial. Love of God, love for God. And that is what sustains us in the times of trials and testings. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes from verses 19 to 20. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience towards God, a man, a person endures grief when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if you, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So we see clearly from these passages that the follower of Jesus is encouraged to endure, is encouraged to suffer from a position and a posture of hope and victory, my friends, because of the sacrifice, the death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't suffer from a place of hopelessness and defeat, but we posture ourselves knowing that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will come through into a place of peace and wholeness and eternal joy in our God. I want to make this even more uh, personal and even more practical for us as I, as I summarize what I want to be sharing. And, and, and just to help us respond to God in a manner that what these verses that we just read would become real in our lives. That we would not exalt uh, our pain, but we would exalt Jesus, who is the hope and strength and peace in our pain. That we would exalt him who is the giver of life and who is the assurance of eternal life. And uh, so I want to sum it up and make it practical in, two, in three aspects. Number one, unto God. What should be our response to God? The Bible says, submit to him because he is with you. You know, here is our Lord who is not, you know, away from us. He's a suffering Messiah, a Messiah who suffered for us. He knows what suffering is. He knows what it's to be tempted, yet without sin. He knows what it is to be tested. He was rejected. He was beaten. He was mocked. And he was crucified on a cross for our sins. We can never even come close to understanding. Never. What the Lord went through for our sake. But here, the risen Lord, he's with us when we go through our suffering. He was with me that day. He was with me every moment, even after that. He's with me right now. And he's with you, my brother and my sister. And he will supply you with grace, maybe not answers, but something far better than answers. He will give you himself, his presence, his word, his people. Yes, people. God will bring precious people in your life 
through whom he will bring forth comfort and encouragement and strength and support. So submit to him. And how do you submit to God? I mean, how do you really get into that posture of saying, God, I exalt you. Jesus, I exalt you. And Holy Spirit, I depend on you. Rehearse the gospel. Oh, the gospel brings us to him always. The gospel keeps us in him. So rehearse the gospel to yourself. Worship him. When I don't know what to do, then I do the one thing that I can do no matter what. I pick up my guitar and I worship. So when you don't know what to do, do what you know will help you come closer to God and keep you with him. For me, it's picking up my guitar and just singing simple songs of worship. That's the way I submit to my Lord. That's the way I worship him. That's the way I choose not to exalt what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, but I choose to exalt him. That doesn't mean I don't pour out my heart. I don't share my heart with him. But there is an end to that. I just can't keep rehearsing my pain. I want to rehearse the gospel. I want to exalt him. Because I know that I may not get all the answers now, but I know that there will be a time when he will give me the answers. He will wipe away the tears. He will hold me in his embrace for eternity. He will grant me all the desires of my heart and keep me at his right hand where there are pleasures forevermore, joy unspeakable. So worship him. Thank him. I remember a few days or just a couple of days after my Farah went to be with the Lord. I, I did something, and I'm sharing this, something very personal. I don't remember, recollect whether I shared this with you all earlier. But um, it was just so traumatizing. Um, I, 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 I didn't know what to do. Um, so I took out a piece of paper. I've, I've, I have not done this very often, but I took out a sheet of paper and I began to write down Four reasons why I could thank God in that time. Four things. It's still in my Bible. It's very precious. I won't share the details. But four reasons that I could thank God in that time. And uh, it lifted me up from that place of pain. And I can't say despair. I don't think I ever despaired. But it was just raw pain to a place where I found my feet upon the rock. And I would encourage you to do that, beloved. Do whatever you it comes instinctively to you to help you submit to God and to exalt him in that place in your life. Number two is allow the Lord to work in you. Don't condemn yourself, but prayerfully ask the Lord for discernment, the reason for the suffering so you can respond wisely. Is this a test to mature you? Is this a discipline to correct you? Are you suffering because of your wrong? Still, God will be merciful to you and help you. So you need to discern that why is this coming? Is this a persecution for your faith? Uh, is this a maturing? Is this beyond your control, but God just wants to mature? Is this a pruning? Or a, 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 what, what could this be? It, no matter what it is, God is with you. But don't condemn yourself because that would not help. But ask the Lord for discernment, the cause of the suffering, to an extent so you can respond wisely and be open to him. Amen. And thirdly, important, beloved, forgive people who would have wronged you. You know, many times pain comes, unfortunately, through people. People say and do hurtful things. And many times they do it without any reason. We don't know why. It's probably because they are hurting themselves. They are, they are imperfect. They are incomplete. And they've probably not been able to apply the gospel in those areas of their life. Unbelievers, we understand, but sometimes believers being hurtful uh, is, is ununderstandable. But no matter what, let the waters of your heart be sweet. Don't be anxious, surely not be vengeful, but ask the Lord to give you the grace to forgive and forgive without delay. And at times you will have to keep rehearsing the forgiveness till the pain is healed and you're made whole in Christ. Remember, beloved, when you forgive, you imitate your father, and that's a great joy and reward. When you forgive, you imitate your father. So keep the waters of your heart sweet. Um, let Jesus not be disappointed with the condition of your heart. My father would always remind me of that. Check your heart, Shannon, and make sure that it's a well-watered, 
blooming garden uh, full of sweetness of the Lord. So submit to God. Uh, don't condemn yourselves, but be open to what the Lord is doing in the time of suffering and forgive those who wrong you. I hope this message has encouraged you, beloved. It's not a complete um, you know, narrative uh, you know, in, on apologetics and theology on suffering. You want to talk? Welcome. We can sit over a cup of coffee and talk. We'd be glad to do so, and I would be happy to share more from my life. But beloved, know this. God is not the source and author of evil and suffering. Uh, mankind has brought this on himself and themselves by inst being instigated by, by Satan. But know this, that our Father, who is all good, and all powerful, and all loving, has already given us the full assurance that he's going to bring this to an end soon. So till that time, walk in faith and obedience, live in the fear of God, and endure. Endure. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. Amen. <laughs>